I appreciate y'all having me on today. My name is Cleve Rowland. I'm from Miller County. Um, I'm the principal here at Miller County Middle School. Uh, just a little demographics about our school and about our county. Um, we're like most counties in the in the state. We're having to deal with these issues, and um, and I, I appreciate y'all giving this advice to to the communities and to the schools because this is great advice about how to get the school year started off. And I appreciate Stephanie and Karen. One of the things I do want to say about the university extension, we are very appreciative of our 4-H person here. Our 4-H person here is Ms. Jody Hodges. Uh, she does a great job with our kids. She works with our science teacher developing the curriculum, helping develop the curriculum. She does projects after they um, have instruction um, that enhances that instruction, that enhances that in cur curriculum, that allows the kids to have a deeper understanding of the science. And we are very, very appreciative of the 4-H program and what goes on here um, at our school. And I just want to tell you that. Thank you so much for that. This year is definitely, um, I've been in education for 19 years. This year is definitely different than any year that I've ever been a part of. And last year was definitely different than any other year that I've been a part of. I had a student that was a senior last year here at Miller County, and we had to do things a lot different. He missed out on most of his baseball um, playing time and it was very regret when I, you know, I, it's, it's tough for all the kids around the state that were seniors last year and we hate it and this looks like this year is going to be another tough year that we're going to have to um, all all join together and try to make the most of it and, and um, like Karen was saying, you know, with the chronic stress, I know it's even more stressful now with the situation of COVID that families are having to deal with in the communities. Um, being sick and family members being sick and the fear of being sick. Um, and I appreciate y'all letting me come on and give a, a school level perspective of what we're seeing and what we're looking at here at the schools and how we're hearing from families. A little bit about Miller County. Miller County's got about 5,800 um, people that live in Miller County. There's about 850 students here. We have an elementary, middle, and high school. And um, we are a very small, tight-knit community. We are an agricultural-based community. One of the largest employers here is Birdsong Peanut Company. Um, Miller County used to be well-known for producing more peanuts per acre than any other county in the state of Georgia. We have a very good soil quality here. We have a Gray and Tifton, Grady and Tifton soil here, which is a great producer for lagoon crops like peanuts. Um, but um, we are very proud to be from Miller County, and it is a very close-knit um, community here. What I wanted to talk to you about, and if we could go to the next slide, we're going to review our current back-to-school plan. And I know um, when you're talking about a back-to-school plan, you definitely want to have stakeholder input. Um, you want to have parent input. And one of the things that we did, we wanted to make sure that um, – that we sent out a survey to parents and stakeholders. We did that this summer. And uh, when we got the survey back, we noticed that um, some things there to kind of how to drive instruction. Um, we also have to continuously look at our COVID numbers. Um, I know our COVID numbers right now in Miller County are, are a little high. We've had over 50 cases in the last two weeks. We've got a little over 200 cases presently. Um, and that kind of drives the when we start school because we were originally supposed to start school August the 10th. Um, and we had a few cases here in the school. We had a, um, a few teachers that, you know, that tested positive. We also had um, teachers that were exposed to other people. So we had, a, had some exposure there. So we had to delay school. And um, that's one of the things that different communities are having to deal with. They're having to look at their local district. They're having to look at how their local situation is and how um, things are going on locally. And that's what we had to do here. Um, we're not supposed to start back until September the 8th. Um, so, you know, y'all pray for us, pray for all the administrators, pray for the students and the parents as, as they are coming back to school here at Miller County. Um, of that survey, one of the things about that survey we had um, probably about 40% of the parents respond to that survey. Out of that 40%, we probably had about 60 to 65% of those parents say that they wanted face-to-face -face instruction. They were very adamant about that. But then on the other hand, we had some parents that said they wanted to be hybrid, wanted the hybrid model. We had some parents that said 
that they wanted to be have the virtual option. And I can understand and I appreciate our school superintendent here, um, Mr. Shane Miller, affording that opportunity to the parents that allow them to do the virtual option. Um, as most of you know, we have something called the CARES Act money that comes from the federal government. That CARES Act money was sent to schools from the federal government and what that allows us to do is be able to utilize those resources so we can provide things for virtual learners, um, so we can provide the cleaning supplies, so we can, it, it just covers a multitude of things that the school needs. And right now the school is in, in dire need of those things. Um, so we appreciate what what's, was sent to us and we're gonna use it wisely here at Miller County. Um, one of the things that I know that we, we just talked about today, like when we're playing sports, team, other sports teams, GHSA has recommended that we provide the water for the visiting team. So we ordered a pallet you know, of water to be sent over to the board office today. Things of that nature. Cases that we have to have um, for the Chromebooks, allowing students to only have you know, one Chromebook. And this is kind of, I'm kind of overlapping some in the health, health and safety measures for back to school and I'm gonna get into that in just a minute, but um, the amount of money that it takes to, to do this is extra money. And, and one of the things about Miller County, we're a very small county, we're a very rural county and our tax base is not that high. We don't have a very high tax base here. And a lot of our family farms here, they, are, they participate in the CUVA. And what the CUVA is, is um, you, you agree to not sell your land for 10 years and you put it in a conservation, make sure it's in a conserve and um, you will get 50% reduction in your property tax. So we, um, we also have a, a wildlife management area here. There's about 181,000 acres in Miller County. There's a wildlife management area here. It's called Mayhaw Wildlife Management Area. And that is four to 6,000 acres. And we, get, we receive no property taxes from that. So we really have to watch what we spend here when we have a lot of different people doing multitude of things. So um, that's one of the things about Miller County. We are, we have a very tight budget here and we appreciate the extra money that comes in to be able to facilitate during this COVID crisis. Um, health and safety, if we could go to the next page here. This is the signage that was ordered. This is part of what was ordered with that money. Um, we're putting these up and down the hall. Of course, you know that the uh, state school superintendent has been doing a great job of keeping schools in the know and knowing what to do, um, kind of giving us some guidance. We've also gotten a lot of guidance from DPH, which I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit also. But these are some of the signs that we purchased and we put up and down throughout the school. The next sign, next um, page, please. Also another sign, and if you can see there, we've also got hand sanitizer stations throughout the building. We want to make sure those are throughout the building. Um, we also had to cut off the water fountains and we are actually purchasing waters for kids and kids are encouraged to bring their own waters, but we're not going to let a kid go without water here. We also have some water refilling stations at some different parts of the school that we're going to allow kids to refill their water containers also. So the, the um, for safety measures, we're not going to have the, utilize those water fountains as well. If we could go to the next slide, DPH guidance, guys. This is a um, this is very important. The DPH guidance. We typically um, this is a, a pretty thick book of DPH guidance, and we have a our school nurse. I tell you, our school nurse has done a phenomenal job. She has to um, daily. She has to stay in contact with staff. Um, she does an um, exposure list that's sent to the Department of Public Health. Um, we are constantly talking with our local public health department and with the Southwest Georgia Public Health Department there as well, letting them know about the cases, the exposures, and, and things of that nature. They also, DPH gives our nurse guidance on things that we need to do. And, and, and guys, you know that all schools are doing this. We're limiting the limiting the people that come in the building to essential personnel. Um, we don't want people coming in the building that might could, you know, expose our kids to, to anything coming in the building. We're also taking, we've purchased several thermometers. That's 
what the money was used for as well. And those thermometers before kids and staff come in, we are taking temperatures and making sure no one is sick when they enter the building. So that's another thing that's used. Um, I'm gonna go over a few of the safety and security measures. Um, we're gonna disinfect when, when, when kids transition out of the room, we're gonna disinfect all of the areas there before another group comes in. And we're gonna kind of limit that transition. We're gonna keep kids in um, most classes for two hours and limit the transition in the halls. And we've also been practicing out in the hallway to make sure we have people spaced out in the hall when we do that transition period. No lockers will be issued at this time. Um, staff members will be required to wear masks when not able to social distance. Cleaning sanitation schedules have been set up for classroom. All students are encouraged to wear masks, but especially during transition times and when social distancing is not possible. Visitors inside the building, I talked about that. Health and, safe, health and safety signage is placed around the building. Adjusting recess and activity period daily temperature checks and weaving temperature checks throughout the day. Um, efforts will be made to minimize the number of students in the class. And you know, one of the things about the, the people signing up, the parents signing up to do the virtual learning, right now out of 850 students, we've got 250 students in the school that are gonna be doing the virtual option. This allows us to be able to social distance in the classroom by those students doing the, um, the virtual so that um, is going to allow we looked at our numbers the other day they're about probably about 13 14 15 is the most in each classroom because of us doing the virtual option um, efforts to decrease the movement transition and policies regarding students leaving and re-entering we don't want students to leave and then come back in you know to go out something for something frivolous we realize they have to have doctor's appointments or legal appointments of that nature. So, um, but we wanna make sure that when they come back in, it was for something that was appropriate. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, this is one of the things that the, the department, Superintendent Woods has sent us, transparency, safety measures are essential, screen and monitor for COVID, sanitize, practice good hygiene and wash hands, social distancing whenever possible and to wear a mask. We were very fortunate to have our emergency management agency as well as the hospital authority to provide us and give us and donate masks and donate hand sanitizer. Also our local Southwest Georgia RESA has also donated 42 bottles of hand sanitizer. They've donated shields, they've donated coverings. So you know, this is a really trying time, but it's a time where people are pulling together. Um, we've got the different agencies coming together. We see, you know, University of Georgia Ag Extensions pulled together with us and they're, they're helping us, you know, do these things. Our hospital here, our churches here have also come together with us, our faith-based communities. Um, it's amazing when you have trying times, you have people come together in different parts of the community come together to try to help and make a situation better during these times. Um, one of the things that our tech director is having to do, he's having the noble task of having to, in a community like Miller County, we're a very rural community. So everyone knows that we do not have a whole lot of um, high tech. We're not very high tech around here. So um, our tech director is doing a phenomenal job. He, is, he has um, gotten some a hot spots from the DOE. The DOE has given us five hot spots. He's going to purchase some more hot spots. But we're talking to our um, local church pastors, and we're going to see about putting those hot spots at the churches with the big parking lots. If students don't have um, if students don't have the internet access, they can travel to these churches that are located out in the country and park in um, the big parking lots out there and they will be able to have internet access um, for their computers and sit there and do their work. Um, you know, we had talked about possibly doing it in buses, but we found, we had heard that the, um, the battery, battery power doesn't last long for, on the buses with the hot spots, so it would be better to hardwire it and do it at a, a, a location that's spread out throughout the county. So that was some of the things. One of the things we did to figure out the locations that didn't have much internet access 
we had teachers during the summer, they were calling students and emailing parents and trying to find out who did and did not have internet access. And then our technology director got a grid to find out the locations within the county that didn't have um, feasible internet access so we could put those hot spots in those locations. So we're very thankful for him and the work he's done. He has really done a, a, a really, really good job. Um, we've talked about DPH coordination with the school nurse, um, nutrition and transportation. Our transportation department also is following the same guidelines. They're taking temperatures before students get on the bus. They're cleaning the buses. They're doing social distancing whenever possible on the buses. And I know with also with the students doing virtual, that's limiting the amount of kids on the bus at this time. So um, our transportation part department's doing that. Another thing with nutrition, we felt like students needed to be fed the, social, the ones that were doing the virtual learning. So what our, our um, nutrition director is doing, she will be feeding the um, students that are doing the virtual learning and they will be fed, they will get the groceries once a week like we did during the summer and they will pick up in the back, the very back. That, that way, like Karen said, a, a, a good diet, they can have um, vegetables, fruit, some very, very good foods to have during the week. And we wanted to definitely make sure that happened for our students because nutrition is, is something that's very much needed in this, this part of the country. Counseling plan for virtual learners. Um, if you could go to the, go to the next um, go to the next slide for me, please, sir. Um, that okay. One of the things I do want to touch on, and this will be the last part. Um, you know, students um, are coming from situations possibly where they've been cooped up in the house with someone, and um, maybe uh, their uh, mental uh, mental facility faculties are not where they need to be. So. We definitely make sure need to make sure we work in conjunction with our different agencies in the county. We definitely uh, have a very very good counselor here that's going to see about the students. We also work with another agency that comes in once a week to see students um, because our our closest mental health facility is about 30 miles from Miller County, so some people don't have transportation to get there. So we arranged last year to have a a, a company come in and they actually see students once a week but for the virtual learners one of the things we wanted to make sure of our counselor has worked with our local southwest georgia risa and they've come up with some questions um that whenever our teachers call their teachers are going to be required to call once a week and check on our virtual learners there's going to be specific questions that they're going to ask to make sure that the students are getting what they need that what they need and then they're in a safe environment um, we've also got a healthy relationship and a very good relationship with our local sheriff's department and our local city police department. And if the needs, need arises, we can do what's called a wellness check from the school to make sure that students have what they need that are the virtual learners also. So, you know, this is a time where everybody has to collaborate, work together, um, and, and we've definitely seen that. And I definitely appreciate University of Georgia Extension um, putting on this webinar and uh, helping, helping people as we deal with these trying times. I appreciate it.